Boker Tov, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Danun Institute of Biblical Research. And by the way, this will probably air on Israeli News Live. If you are watching this on Israeli News Live, uh, keep in mind, and you follow our teaching side of the ministry, Israeli News Live will continue to do news broadcasts as well as prophetic insights on our news broadcast uh, continuing. That will not change, but teaching such as this will eventually stop happening here on Israeli News Live. So look in the description below. Find right there at the very beginning of the description, Danun Institute, our YouTube channel. Copy paste that link. Go there, subscribe so that you won't miss these type of teachings as well. Anyway, right into the message here I want to share with you today. Uh, and I owe a debt of gratitude to our sister Jennifer who really inspired this message when she asked a question from Joel chapter um, I don't know if that's chapter 3 or chapter 4 in the King James Version Bible, but it was about the selling the boy for a harlot and selling the girl for wine. And God really began to deal with me on this, and of course, so many other things from the book of Joel that I really was felt uh, pressed to come and bring and share this with you. Uh, also, one other thing as well, an announcement I want to make uh, for you. On March the 28th, 2017, this year, uh, only a couple of months away, almost three months away actually, uh, we will be having a special meeting in Israel. Uh, we have not set the venue as of yet. Uh, it'll be in the afternoon. So if you would like to attend this, you will be invited to do so. Uh, but very special meeting that we'll be holding there this year in Israel. Uh, and so just email us. Uh, I will actually give you a different email address at first when we go to do that uh, so that you can contact me and we can once we can come up with an email address. But just to kind of give you some advance warning now, so if you want to start making plans, you can do so. And if you'd like to support the work that we are doing, whether it be for this Israeli mission that we'll be dealing with there in Israel, reaching out to the, uh, the Jewish community, as well as the Christian, our Christian friends that will be joining us as well. Uh, you can do so by going to IsraelReturns.com or IsraeliNewsLive.org. Either place has a place you can donate for, for this type of event and other works that we're doing here. Uh, and as well, you can um, e uh, mail us as well, which you'll see at the end of this broadcast. Uh, our mailing address here in the Czech Republic, that is P.O. Box 461506, Prague uh, 56, that's Czech Republic. Anyway, let me get right into the message though. Again, like I said, such an inspiring, inspiring message there. Uh, you know, you guys, most of you are familiar with chapter 1 in Joel. Joel is where God uh, speaks to Israel and he's really abrading the priest for allowing the Word of God to become eaten up by the, by the palmer worm, the, the locust, and the canker worm that have just devoured God's principles and plans down through the years to the point to where he, he likens this to the, to the uh, fig tree and the, and the pomegranate trees and everything is just ate away and nothing is left for people. The word had been so chewed up. Now, it doesn't mean that God doesn't have his word. The point is, is it had just become a commonplace thing. And the priest had made it as if it doesn't matter, perhaps, is where we're looking at this. And this is where we really begin to see something, though, that, that caught my attention when I looked at this, especially because we get into chapter 2. And chapter 2 is where you find out one of the first places we find out about the former and latter rain and what this really means, how it's written in Hebrew. So let's pick up with chapter 2 where he says, first off, Blow you the horn in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is at hand. This is in Zion. Remember the prophecy of Micah where God promises to return the Jewish people, the house of Judah and the house of Israel to Zion, to Mount Zion. He says, and I will be with them and I will be there even forevermore. All right, now, and speaking of that, let me just, I'll just quickly jump there for you because I think it's important that I, that I just quickly touch on Micah 4 there because it has a lot to do with Mount Zion and blowing the trumpet there, right? So he says, um, Micah chapter 4, here we go, right here. 
So he says right here in verse 6, And that day saith the Lord, I will assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven away, and her that I have afflicted, and I will make her a halted a remnant, and her that was cast far off, a mighty nation. The Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forevermore. But when you get to verse 9, something is happening. He says he brings them back. He's going to be them with forevermore. And then Calamity sets in. Now why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is thy counselor perished? Thy pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail. Be in pain and labor to bring forth the daughter of Zion like a woman in travail. For now thou shalt go forth out of the city and shalt dwell in the field and shalt come even into Babylon. There shalt thou be rescued and there shall the Lord redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. Keep in mind a couple of things. God is going to redeem her from the hand of her enemies and as well she Christ, God says, is there no king in thee? Why? Because Israel had rejected God's way of dealing with her through Samuel the prophet when they wanted a king to be like the rest of the nations. We give them a king. And in this case here, we're dealing with modern day Israel's and of course, Prime Minister Netanyahu, though he has done the best that he knows to do, he was anointed to be a king over Israel by Mike Evans through an anointing that God placed on Mike to do so. And yet he's not able to deliver Israel from all the nations that are gathered against them. And don't think, by the way, that President Barack Hussein Obama, that he didn't play his part in this either. I know some people think that, well, he didn't bring about a war with Russia. He was fighting Russia in Syria before he left office when the Russians and the Syrian military cornered in Aleppo 250 U.S. Army soldiers there along with 54 British Special Forces that were fighting alongside of the moderate rebels so to speak they're fighting against the Syrian army and the Russians as well so yes they did start that war it did start in the Middle East and not only that Obama played a major role in December 23rd, 2016, when he actually got the United Nations to come together to sign Resolution 2334, and America did not uh, uh, veto this, which allowed Psalm 83, the covenant that was being put together, a conspiracy, so to speak, against Israel, where all the nations have gathered against Israel, according to Psalm 83, and I've told you guys this for years, Psalm 83 is not a war. Psalm 83 is Israel crying out to God to protect them because all the nations are gathered against them, but the war hadn't started as of yet, and Obama was the major role player in that. We saw in Paris, France, when my wife and myself were there, uh, we were they're covering this particular news footage that was happening as the 75 nations came against Israel and they were voting against them. All right. So he played his part as well. Don't think he did not. And so we find out that Israel is, is there. And also David notes in there, is thy counselor, excuse me, Micah, is thy counselor perished? Thy pains have taken hold of thee as a woman in travail. Who is the counselor? You're not talking about the wise counsel of Netanyahu. Have they perished? He's talking about you let your counselor perish 2,000 years ago. All right? So think about these things. Just think about that. All right? Now let's go. Let's, let's run back over here real quick to Obadiah. I mean, excuse me, to Joel. And we find that they blow, that whole, they blow the horn on Mount Zion. This is where it all begins at. Israel's in her homeland on Mount Zion. A day of darkness and gloominess. A day of clouds and thick darkness is blackness. Spread upon the mountains a great people, a mighty hath, hath not been ever like, neither shall any more after them, even to the years of many generations. You know what's interesting? He goes in here, he says, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them it blazeth. And the land is a garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, nothing escapeth them. That's about the way the United States is done. Everywhere they have gone, even when John F. Kennedy was trying to stop the war in Vietnam, America, the, the, the presidents before and the president after Lyndon B. Johnson, they continued that war. They gave these elites what they wanted. Burn the nations down. Under President Bush, we had the, where they're going to take over all these different nations in the Middle East. Syria, Iran, Iraq, uh, uh, Yemen, and, and I believe it was the seven nations that were going to overthrow in Iraq. And that's, that's exactly what they were planning on. And they've actually accomplished a pretty good job of it. Iraq just became a smoldering heap. And Syria, even more so, had Russia not stepped in. And it's not to say that Russia's doing any better. Russia's helping to level all the cities as well. But at least Russia was trying to fight for Bashar al-Assad, who seemed to be trying to do the right thing when you had a country before the fall of this nation, thanks to Hussein Obama, they were actually a, a nation that 
that had inclusion of their religions. So, you know, th this is what really troubles me. It just troubles me to see this happening. Now, you're going to find out, though, that if, well, once we drop down here to, say, verse 17, though, this, this military is actually what is spoken of in Daniel 11. Okay? It is that... It's the king of the north's military, which I believe is NATO. Let the priest, the minister of the porch of the... Uh, wait a minute, let me see if that's the right place here. No, I'm sorry, verse 20. And I will remove far off from you the northern one, and will drive him into a land barren and desolate, with his face toward the eastern sea, and his hinder part toward the western sea, and his foulness may come up, and his ill savor may come up, because he hath gone, because he hath done great things. Not great things as far as good things. You know, it's funny how he mentions there, you know, one part even goes to the eastern sea, the other part to the western sea. That's, the United States is about the most accurate description I could think of to fit that. Because they have been the general for Rome's NATO forces. All right, now, let me jump up here to verse 17 real quick. Let the priests and the ministers of the Lord, uh, let me first, verse 16, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children and those that suck the breast, let the bridegroom go forth from his chamber and the bride out of her pavilion. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thy heritage to reproach that the nation should make them a byword. You know something? Let me tell you something, friends. And this is ministers. I don't care whether you're, whether you're a Jewish rabbi or not, or, or a minister of the gospel, or the people around the world, both Jew and Gentile alike. United States, Europe, Africa, South America, Russia, China, Japan, the, 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 the islands, wherever ministers may be, you should be praying and weeping and crying out to God that he will spare his heritage, Israel. Because as we can see right now, all the nations, thanks to Hussein Obama and his Psalm 83 uh, attack along with Esau. By the way, they lifted up their head. Their head was not Obama. Their head is the Pope of Rome. Okay, but they have come against Israel. The nations have met, and they are forming that alliance together to come against Israel, and the militaries will be the next ones that will come. All right, but let's move on down. Fear, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord hath done great things. Be not afraid, ye beasts of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness do spring, for the tree beareth its fruit and fig tree, and the vine do yield their strength. Isn't that amazing? God in his mercy cares for the animals. It's a whole lot more than most people do. And I will say something about this. What it tells us, though, is a millennial message. We know that in the millennium, God has said, nothing shall hurt nor destroy. We found in a scripture I shared with you the other day, I forget exactly where it's at, but it's in a message I shared with you the other day. And uh, I said there, I, I showed you this one where God says he will break the sword and the bow. And he makes a covenant with the animals. And that is the message that God will bring to Israel. Why? Because Israel is getting ready to start again the sacrificial service. Was Yeshua not enough? That we have to go back to animal sacrifices again? And yet, my Jewish brothers and sisters, do you not know that he says he's going to make a covenant with them and that he will break your sword and your bow? That's your millennial message. Nothing shall hurt nor destroy in all of my holy mountain. That's restoring the word of God back. Okay? Now, let's move on. Be glad then, you children of Zion. There it is again. Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he giveth the former rain in just measure, and he causeth to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain at the first. Let's look at this. Uvanet Zion, gilu shemachu bechaya el yachem. Okay. Ki natan lechem et hamore. That's not just a rain. Why do they leave that word out? Why do all translators leave it out? See, because. It'll be, I will give to them the what? 
the teaching. By the way, the word Geshem is not even there. Not there. It is there. It's right here, down here in the next sentence. Let Sadach. By the way, he's going to give, the, I'm going to give you the, the teaching of righteousness. They don't even translate it right in this one here. Mamre Online is terrible. For he giveth you the, he, see, he said right here, for he giveth you the former rain in just measure. He didn't say that. Ki natan lachem erch morei latzedach. Because he will give to, to them the teaching of righteousness. All right? But it does speak about the former and latter rain. What is the former and latter rain? It is the teaching of righteousness. It is when the word of God falls down upon the people in righteousness. And today you're going to find out what that word was. All right? And he caused it to come down on you the rain, the former rain and the latter rain. Okay? The yored lechem geshem. To come down on them rain more. Again, they leave out the word teaching altogether. Why? I guess I figured it's not worth it. At the first. Well, you know what's interesting? Do you know what's at the first? It's an exodus. And let me see if I put this in my notes because I see I forgot to put it up here on the board for you as well. Yes, Exodus chapter 40. And let me just, let me just, we, we need to pull this up. Because it is major important to know what was the former rain. Without knowing what the former rain is, you won't know what the latter rain is, will you? And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month shall thou rear up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. Nisan 1. Okay? That's when it was. And thou shalt put therein the ark of the testimony, and thou shalt screen the, dark, the ark with the veil. The ark will be covered with the veil. Do you realize that the temple itself, the first temple was not made out of stones? As Roddy Brown, my good friend in Israel, used to say, what's the difference between that temple and the temple we had in Hezekiah's time, or the first and second temple, Solomon's temple, etc.? The one of Solomon is made with stone. The one that was in the wilderness was made with skins and was mobile. And you, my friend, are the temple of God. You are mobile and you are made with skins. And in your heart is where the Holy of Holies is supposed to reside. And by the way, the veil, notice it said, Thou shalt screen the ark with the veil. Even in that one there, there was a veil. Remember when it said when Yeshua died on the cross and it said the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. And they all could see. I believe that that veil, although the temple veil no doubt was rent as well, but I believe that the veil that God was speaking of then was the veil of the eyes of those that were around. And when the veil was rent, when the veil of his body was rent, their eyes came open and they could see that it was the Shekinah, it was the Holy One of Israel living inside of that man. And even the Roman soldier said, truly, this was the Son of God. That was the veil. That was the veil that was lifted, the veil of their eyes. And we know we can even see this in, this, in, in the New Testament writings. The veil is still over their eyes until this day. So it must have not everybody saw it. Hmm. Think about that one, right? So, and thou shalt bring the table and set the order of the bread is upon it. And thou shalt, you know, he goes into to the order of how he's going to do it. But watch what happens though, as we move down. You know, this, this, is, this is on the first of Nisan. This was the first pouring down of the first rain, the former rain. Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him, so he, so he did. And it came to pass in the first month and the second year on, that, on the first day of the month that the tabernacle was reared up. And Moses reared up the tabernacle and laid its sockets and set its boards in thereof and put the bars thereof and reared it up the pillars. 
And he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent above it. And as the Lord commanded Moses, and he took and put the testimony in the ark and set the staves of, of the, on the ark and put the ark and the cover above upon the ark. Now, as we go on down, He goes into all the orders in which he dies, but there's one thing that you need to see. Even the washing, the priests, Aaron and his sons, they did all this. Then we get down to verse 33. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle of the altar and set up the screen of the gate of the court. So Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of the meeting and the glory of the Lord, Yahuwah, filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of meeting because the cloud abode there. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And when the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the children of Israel went onward throughout all their journeys. But if the cloud was not taken up, then the journey journeyed not till the day that it was taken up. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and there was a fire therein by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout all their journeys. Do you realize that that cloud was there for seven days? The former rain. The former rain, the teaching rain, the, the, the true word of God that Moses first brought was the fact that God is the one that dwells within you. The living word dwells within you. There's a lot more can be said. We know Israel leaves Egypt at that beginning of months for them. But you have your two witnesses coming. They're going to bring, as it says over there in Joel, they're going to bring the first and the, they're going to bring the former and the latter rain and what is the latter rain message? The latter rain message is to Israel to open their eyes to know that God is going, wanting to dwell within you. Even Moses taught this in Deuteronomy when he says to the people, why do you traverse the sea? Why do you go dig in the ground looking for the word of God when the word of God is very nigh you, even in you, in your heart and in your mouth? Get the word of God in you and then your mouth will speak the right things. I don't know for what all is going to be said. I have no idea how the Lord will lead those two witnesses when they come on the scene. But I know they're going to bring one thing and that's for sure. They're going to teach them what they're going to teach them the teachings of what righteousness. Just like it says right there. And you know why that you know why Israel today doesn't have the teaching of righteousness? Because you cut off the priesthood. Back during the time of the Maccabee revolt, the Maccabees did a great thing. They took back the temple. They were trying to purify the temple. But what happened? The true Sadak priesthood was cut off and they went into exile. That's what happened. That's where you got your Qumran community. This was your Sadak priest. This was your, they had their teacher of righteousness, which some believe was Yeshua. Like to know what the rest of those books were, wouldn't you? Well, it's written inside of you. It's passed down from generation to generation. No wonder why Moses will take the rod of his, of his heritage and go and teach these things to the children of Israel. All right? So this is that former and latter reign. Now, let's move on for the sake of time here. Now, also, in Jeremiah, some things I want to share with you. For among my people are found wicked men. They pry as fowlers. Lie in wait, they set a trap, they catch men. As a cage full of birds, so are their houses full of deceit. Therefore, they, 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 are, they are become great and wax and rich. They are wax and fat, they are become sleek, yea, they overpass in deeds of wickedness and they plead not the cause of the, of the fatherless and they, they, that they might make it prosper and they write of the needy to do, thy, do they not judge. Shall I not punish for these things, saith the Lord? Shall not my soul be avenged on the, such a nation as this? An appalling, horrible thing has come to pass in the land. The prophets prophesy in the service of falsehood and the priests bear rule 
at their beck, and my people love to have it so. What then will you do in the end thereof? Isn't that terrible? Mm. Good things. This is why we have the problem that we have today. Now, there may have been another reason why I had Jeremiah open it. I, I just, I did not make myself a note on that. Let's move on to Hosea, though. I do know why I have Hosea. I want to start with chapter 5, because Hosea here it deals a lot with Joel chapter 2 as well. And it says here, uh, let me go down uh, in Hosea. We want to go to the last verse. Actually, verse 14 and verse 15. For I will be unto Ephraim as a lion, as a young lion to the house of Judah. I even will tear and go away, and I will take away, and there shall be none to deliver. This is the final expulsion of both the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Now notice what the Lord says. I will go and return to my place till they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their trouble, they, see, they will seek me earnestly. Now for God to go away, and you need to look at this as well. Uh, el -cha, Ashuva el mekumi. Mekum is my place. Uh, the yod there for my place. But God is going to return. That tells us, my brethren, that he was here. Is there something we missed? My Jewish brothers, sisters, is there something we missed? He must have been here or he couldn't return. You cannot shuv, ashuva. He could not return unless he was here. And he does it when... According to verse 14, I'll be as a young lion to the house of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah came. He prevailed, but you didn't think so. You're too hung up on, well, the millennial reign was supposed to start. But you always forget, too, even in, even in the Talmud, it is written that the Messiah would be cut off before the destruction, or would have to come before the destruction of the second temple. Wow, you know that. So do I. So do a lot of people. But did you know that he was among us and he went back to his own place? What did Yeshua say? I go to my father. I go back to my father. Didn't he say to you, I come from my father? We missed that though, didn't we? What a shame. Now let's go to the next Let's go now to the next uh, chapter, chapter 6. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his presence. Okay? And let us know eagerly, strive to know the Lord. His going forth is sure as the morning. He shall come forth unto us in the, in, in, when? As the rain, as the latter rain that watereth the earth. By the way, the two days that you have right here, two days, see? Yehuna Mamaim. By the way, that's not speaking of two literal days. Remember the scripture saying, one day with the Lord is a thousand years on earth? It's after two days in the third day. That's kind of interesting. After two days, after 2,000 years, in the third day. And that actually applies to both the house of Judah and the house of Israel because the house of Judah has been dispersed now for over 2,000 years after two days in the third day. They're in the third day now. And also the house of Israel scattered in 70 80 BC, they're in the third day. He will raise us up that we may live in his presence. So we're at the timing, friends. O Ephraim, what shall I do unto thee? O Judah, what shall I do unto thee? For your goodness is as a morning cloud, and as a dew that uh, early passeth away. Therefore have I hewed them by the prophets, I have slain them by the words of my mouth, that thy judgment goeth forth as a light. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. And see, the problem is, he says, what, the other day when I brought that message to you, and I think it's in Hosea as well, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Because let me tell you something, both houses, the house of Judah and the house of Israel, had the true word of Yeshua when he came here. But what did you do with it? 
Part of the house of Judah went into blindness. Only part believed. The Catholic Church killed all those off when Constantine created his own church there. And then they did the Crusades. And they, they made sure they killed all the believing Christians off in northern Africa. And then you take what remnants of the house of Israel that did believe as well, what did you do? You took and combined it and you did exactly what the word says. You take the bribes and everything else and then you mixed up God's teaching, the teachings of Yeshua and you perverted it all the way down and made hundreds and hundreds of de denominations instead of keeping a pure word so that the house of Judah could be taught. You even take up their ways instead. In the Messianic community, you're, you're more worried. You're more worried about keeping all the traditions. God's not, he didn't ask you to keep 613 laws of Levitical law. Go read Ezekiel chapter 20, especially when you get down to verses about 18 to 26 there. Read all that. Do you some good. Then you'll see what he said for you to do. All right? So, so he said, I desire that mercy. But they, like men, transgress the covenant. They have dealt treacherously against me. But the thing is, is that time of redemption is at hand. Let's go to Joel chapter 3, though. We're going to chapter 4 as well. That may be the same chapter for, for the King James Version Bible. I'm not sure. And it shall come to pass after I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men and dream dreams. And your young men shall see visions. And you've got to kind of watch. It's interesting. We see this happening also during the times of Yeshua and also in the times of today, but then he's going he's to reverse back. All right? It's not all chronological, so watch it now. And also upon the servants, upon the handmaids in those days, I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood, fire, pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion, there it is again, Mount Zion in Jerusalem, there shall be those that escape as the Lord hath said, the among the remnant of those whom the Lord shall call. Hmm. Micah chapter 4, remember just a moment ago? Now, let's go on to chapter 4. For behold, in those days and in that time when I shall bring back the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem... I will gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and I will enter into judgment with them there for my people and my heritage Israel whom they have scattered among the nations and divided my land. And you're still trying to divide it. You know over there when it speaks over in Daniel chapter 11 about that, you know, they, that, that, that mighty nation that goes with the foreign god. It's actually a god of a foreign land. That's when you take, that's when Britain took Rome and they worked together during World War I to overtake the Middle East. And you have divided a land that was pro that you even promised out of your own mouth, the British mandate, given Israel in 1920, all, all the land that belongs now the, 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 now that you gave over to the Jordanians, and all the land west of the of the Jordan River. Oh, that was all for a Jewish homeland. But for gain, the Bible says, you divide the land. And of course you did. And two years later, in 1922, you decided to give everything east of the Jordan River to uh, Abdullah, Hussein's son, for helping you to fight that war to overthrow the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire had given the Jews license to go out and buy the land in the Middle East, in their homeland. But you couldn't have that happen. You didn't like it, so you started a war there. Pope got you to do it. Good boy, wasn't he? Well, you act like the Pope's your enemy now, but don't worry, y'all will work together again. Maybe you'll put a new Pope in there. Who knows? It'd be interesting to see, wouldn't it? I've got some thoughts who that might be. But anyway, you divided my land, and you're still doing it. Now you're trying to do a West Bank, and then a Gaza, and whatever more you'll have. And they have cast lots for my people, and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl for wine and have drunk. This is what come down to Sister Jennifer. She sent me the message. Brother Steve, what do, you, what do you think this means? Now, I realize Scripture has compound fulfillment, compound revelation. I'm going to share with you, though, a portion of what the Lord put on my heart. Given a boy for an harlot. Who's the harlot? 
spoken of in Revelation, decks herself with gold and all that, it's the Catholic Church. You gave a boy for a harlot. Actually, the word in Hebrew there is yelled. Now, yalda naturally is a girl, but yelled is generally speaking of a boy, but yelled is also a word used for children. It could be for the children. A yelled, a boy. Let me get right to where we're at here. And here we go, right here. Okay. The El Ami, and to my people, Yaldu Goral. See? Ve itanu hayeled. You give him. You give that boy. How many Jewish little boys were given up during the Holocaust for the Catholic Church to rear to make them Catholic so you could build your Catholic nation later down the road? Think about that. That's something a lot of people ain't going to like to hear, but it's true. Shimon Perez. And I pray that he rest in peace. But the late Shimon Peres sold out Israel to Rome, sent a wire to the Pope of Rome letting him know that Jerusalem, he will deliver Jerusalem into his hands. And according to my good friend, who also has passed away, not only um, Joel Bainerman, but also um, my brain has slipped my mind for a second there but said that written in uh, the autobiography of Yitzhak Rabin was a little off note that Ariel, excuse me, Shimon Perez went to a Catholic school. Hmm. You give your boy for a harlot. Is that what you did? Was Shimon Perez that boy? That child. The girl that was given for, for wine a, a, and sold a girl for wine and have drunk. That is an Obadiah. The girl, by the way, the Yalda, was the young nation of Israel that was sold out so the Pope of Rome could do what? Could drink on God's holy mountain. For as you have drunk upon my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yea, they shall drink and shall swallow down and shall be as though they had not been. But in Mount Zion there shall be those that escape and it shall be holy. And the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. And by the way, The Kodeshi, as we know here, is Mount Zion. Behad Zion. This is masculine plural. Only men drank that day when the Pope of Rome in 2014 on his Easter Sunday goes and has a communion service with the men there, men only, and they drank upon the holy mountain. How did they get it? Because you sold Israel out for nothing. You gave a boy for the harlot. Shimon Perez was given over so that they could sell the girls, sell Israel, so that they could drink. God says you did it for nothing. You don't believe me? Isaiah 52. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beauty garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake thyself from the dust and rise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck and captive, O daughter of Zion. Captive daughter of Zion. For thus saith the Lord, you were sold for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. Isaiah saw it as well. You were sold for nothing. What did Israel get? Nothing. Because you gave the boy over to the harlot and then sold out Israel just so that they could drink on God's holy mouth. You know, friends, God is going to send his two witnesses. And real quick, for the, for the Christian friends that believe that, oh, it can't, you can't, it can't be Moses and, and Elijah, it can't be them because, you know, it's appointed to once a man to die. And they've already, you know, Moses died. He, he's, you know, uh, he can't come back. And, and, and Elijah, he's got to come back, but it's got to be Enoch. All right, then, then real quick. You take it right here from Hebrews, right? 
Whoop, I'm in the wrong book. Yeah, Hebrews. Whoop, nope, I'm still in the wrong book. Hebrews 9. Here we go. But Christ being come and a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle. Again, here we are about the tabernacle, former and latter reign. Not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but his own blood he entered into once the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who hath through the eternal spirit offered himself without the spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is a mediator of the New Testament, that by means of, of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the First Testament, they which are called might be received the promise of the eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also the necess necessity to be the death of the testator. For the testament is enforced after men are dead. Otherwise, it is not the strength of, while the testator liveth. Now, if you notice, though, I think it's in verse 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. It has nothing to do with you or with Moses or with Elijah or anybody else. It's dealing only with the fact that Yeshua came and died once. And by the way, the issue about the blood is because it was the life of Almighty God that was in the blood had to be released to come back upon us. So that is the message that is the latter rain. The former rain was showing that God was to dwell in the temple. The latter rain is going to teach the former rain and the latter rain, which is the God is supposed to live within us. And the only way for that to happen was that, that side, the rock, Remember Moses smote the rock in the wilderness journey, took the elders of Israel out there, judged the rock, and then smote it that it brought forth its waters. Not the time he said, speak to the rock, because see, the rock was only to be smitten once, not twice. Yeshua was only going to be smitten once. And when Yeshua was smitten, the elders of Israel did their job. They smote him. They, they did exactly that, that it brought forth its waters. And the Romans hung him on the cross. The Roman soldier took the spear, stuck it into his side. The blood and the water came out, separated from one another, showing what? that the waters of life had to be separated from the blood so that we could take that water of life within our heart. There is your former and latter rain. That is the splitting of the veil, is to open your eyes to what is going to happen. And this, my friends, is what Revelation 11 is about when the two witnesses come and they will speak and they will bring and they will have all kinds of miracles. They bring judgments and everything else, see? But they also turn the waters are turned to blood to smite the earth and they bring all commanders of plagues to deal with that northern army that is going to be here. But don't forget another thing. Isaiah 61, when Yeshua says, and we're closing right here, Isaiah, this is what, when the priest handed Yeshua the Bible and he, said, he took the book and he read there and he read this part here, the spirit of the Lord of God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good tidings into the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening of the eyes of them that are bound to proclaim the year of the Lord's good pleasure. And then he closed the book and he said, this day this scripture is fulfilled. And my Jewish brother, many of you miss it. He never brought about the vengeance. Why? Because he knew it applied for a future coming. The day of vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. The morning has to come. Zechariah 12, what happens? They look upon him that was thrust through and they separate each one to their own family and they weep and they mourn for days and say, how could we have done this? Like a family that lost their only son. That morning hasn't happened yet. And by the way, look at the names that are in there. It doesn't even give tribal names. The house of David, the house of Nathan, the house of Benjamin, the house, the house of Shimei. Shimei. Isn't it interesting? Shimei like in the days of David when Shimei spit on David when he was going out and cursed him and everything else. But it was Shimei that met him down there at the river when David was coming back and said, have mercy upon me for what I did. I did it and he did it in error. And Shimei was a Benjamite. And it was the Benjamites that just like Benjamin who was not guilty of the blood of Joseph, but yet Joseph put his cup in Benjamin's back knowing that he would have to pay for it in the future because it would be his children that would sell out Yeshua and therefore the cup was in his back because he would sell him out at the communion table through Judas Issachariah. 
And the Benjamites did that. And so Shemite represented there is also representing the tribe of Benjamin. David and Nathan represent the tribe of Judah. And of course, the Levites representing them own selves there. There's the house of Judah. They look upon him, the one that they had pierced. The one they thrust through in case uh, Rabbi uh, uh, Tobias Singer, you're listening. That's right, thrust him through. It's the spear that went to his side. Not so much the nails that pierced his hands and his feet. It was, that, it was the spear that pierced his side that opened up that way. So what happens to proclaim the, the vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn where? In Zion, to give unto them garland for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the mantle of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the terebinths of righteousness, the planting of the Lord wherein he might glory. And they shall build the old ways. They shall raise up the former desolations and they shall renew the waste cities and the desolations of many generations. Yeshua said, your house is left to you desolate until you say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That's the desolation. It's their souls that have been desolate, longing for the word to abide within the former and latter rain. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching the Institute of Biblical Research. Stand with us. Support the work that we're doing here. IsraeliNewsLive.org or IsraelReturns.com. You can support the work we're doing here. And don't forget, we'll be announcing very soon our meeting that we'll be having in Jerusalem on March the 28th. I'm Stephen Benoon. You've been watching the Institute of Biblical Research. Shalom.